Today, we turn up the pressure as we assemble, test, and listen to a laser cut bass horn. We begin with this, courtesy of UPS, which is where I can appreciate the abundance of packing material inside this box. Thankfully, everything arrived unscathed, as you can see in this lovely green shot, but it's also worth noting that, apart from the screws and the laser module, everything in that front row is just accessories leaving precious little in the way of assembly. The instructions call for a single M6 screw in each of the four corners, followed by two more screws, one at either end of the gantry. The laser module slides in, locks off, and that's all she wrote. This is the Master 2S Max from Neige, and it is big. Yeah, yeah, yeah! It's not small! No, no, no! With an engraving area of 810 by 460 millimeters, it just barely fits on the table. The laser is rated at 7.5 watts, that's the optical power, though I may eventually swap it out for the 10 watt module offered by the company as one of the many upgrade packages. One such upgrade is this air assist kit and we'll discuss it in just a minute. For now, let us shift gears and talk acoustics. Right away, I'll admit that the car is not where I get the most out of my listening experience. Not by a long shot, which is why I haven't done anything about the factory speakers or this Kenwood receiver likely dating back to the vehicle's original owner. Setting that aside, however, I do occasionally wonder about things like what might be the smallest bass driver that a mobile sound quality enthusiast could get by with and in what type of enclosure. Well, I've been chewing at that, thinking about the laser, drafting some ideas, ultimately arriving at 4 inches. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm really sorry. <laughs> there, there, George. It's the size of the sound that matters. And we'll take care of it by coupling the driver's output to this nearly two and a half meter long expanding waveguard folded onto itself to form a tapped horn. This particular example of a third order acoustic network benefits from low group delay. Lower, in fact, than that of a proportionate bass reflex simply because there is no compression chamber there to store and to release the energy out of step with the input signal. This also lends itself to a phase response nearly as shallow as that of a proportionate sealed enclosure. Unfortunately, the piston area of this 4-inch mid-bass isn't quite enough to run sealed at any chamber volume, at least not as a subwoofer. And this is precisely where the benefits of horn loading come into play. The high-pressure, low-velocity vibrations at the throat are transformed into low-pressure, high-velocity vibrations at the mouth, allowing for something as small as this to acoustically impedance match with the surrounding airspace well into the bass, if not the sub-bass region. You never go ass to mouth! Tapped horns do, if you'll pardon the analogy, and here's the predicted in-car response at the headrest of my hatchback. I've also modeled it in the corner of a small room, and as you can see, despite the difference in behavior from one listening space to the other, both profiles are quite usable well into the upper 30Hz region, which is about as deep as I'm willing to go without simultaneously compromising the ability to play in volume or making the enclosure any larger than it already is. Speaking of which, the final dimensions will measure 156mm in width, 450mm in height, and 580mm in depth. The build will comprise 24 quarter inch layers with 50 individual pieces forming the body of the waveguide including a pair of mostly double stacked outer walls. These notches will serve to compensate for the cross-sectional blockage presented by the profile of the driver as it protrudes into the mouth of the waveguide, not entirely but enough to matter. Also, to keep everything in line during assembly, each layer will be cut with this pilot hole pattern. 22 screws will be threaded in to provide the alignment and some temporary clamping force along all the key areas. Corners, midpoints, etc. Basically all the places where a conventional ratchet bar should but won't reach. Finally, a 3D printed terminal cup will complete the build portion of the project, though before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's get this air assist figured out. As you can see here, it includes an M8 to M4 fitting reducer, an inline shutoff valve, some screws, a tiny stainless steel pipe, and 2 meters of clear pneumatic tubing. The idea is to direct a stream of compressed air toward the laser's focal point, primarily to expel the carbonized burn residue otherwise left along the surface, but also to evacuate heat reducing the risk of flare-ups. One interesting point of note here is the lack of any mounting brackets. In fact, the product page instructs you to print your own. Assuming, of course, that you have a 3D printer, which I do. Unfortunately, the listed model appears to have been designed for something else and I can't exactly attach it in a way that would point the nozzle at the beam. So I guess I'll just yank this back off, take some measurements, and model a bracket of my own. 
Afterwards, some nondescript red PLA wiggles its way down the gantry and into the extruder, laying down 0.15mm layers with full supports and 100% infill. Here's how the two printed pieces come together, this is how the thing pivots, and here's how it attaches to the laser. The stainless steel pipe will serve as the air nozzle, and once in place I can just lock it off at any angle. The hose will run along the wiring harness, which should keep it out of the way. Then, the shutoff valve can be spliced in just beyond the gantry. Finally, we come to the fitting reducer, which connects all that stuff we just did to a source of compressed air. And here is where I'll point out that my own ability to identify a good air assist compressor does not extend much beyond this article by David Tucker in which he compares several different options with the general consensus being that more PSI is better. So here's my personal pick for the middle ground concession between air pressure and quiet indoor operation. It is the Mac 100Q from Akita, claimed to operate at less than 60 decibels. Claim confirmed. It also comes with a standard quick coupler socket which meant that I got to replace the fitting reducer with a 4mm push to connect adapter made it to a quick coupler plug not included in the kit. So that goes in here and it looks like the pressure through the nozzle tops out around 6 psi, eventually settling at around 4. As you can see, this is just barely enough to form little air dimples on my fingers, but whether or not it makes for an adequate air assist has yet to be established with a series of test cuts. The N4630 laser module comes with a focus adjustment knob which I do not plan to use. So here I am rotating it all the way to the shortest focal point. I also made this contraption to hold a piece of cardboard at a slight incline, and now I'll run the laser across it from a set reference height, say maybe 60mm between the ground plane and the bottom of the heatsink. Here's my first try at 10% power, and well, that's not very definitive, is it? I can tell when the laser comes into focus, but beyond that the nuance is all but lost. So here we go again at 5% power. And this time I can at least tell that the butter zone is somewhere toward the bottom. So I'll just raise this thing another 20 millimeters and give it one final go. There it is. That's what I was looking for. You see this mark here at the end is about as light as the one over here, give or take. And if these are the outskirts, the midpoint represents the optimal focus. Let me just measure that and subtract from a reference height of 80 millimeters. This gives us the target distance between the heatsink and the work surface, a key measurement which I can now use to make a focal gauge. Anyway, here's some quarter inch MDF, here's how simple it now is to set focus, and here's the test cut with the laser at full power, 200 millimeters per minute, and the air assist wide open. This went on for a total of 16 passes, at which point it decided to try again, reducing the travel speed to 100 millimeters per minute. Unfortunately, the beam never made it to the other side, and after a closer inspection it looks like it hasn't even made it halfway through. So there's our medium density materials performance in a nutshell, and I have to think that we'll do better with plywood, birch to be exact. Here's a quarter inch sample with the laser once again traveling at 100 millimeters per minute, and already by the second pass the beam is shining through. All the circular details released by the third pass, and by the fourth we have an impressively clean looking test piece. In fact, now I'm curious about how this would have turned out without the air assist, but first I want to make a pit stop. By the way, here's what 100 bucks will get you at Harbor Freight. If you don't already have a dedicated maker space, this bench is right for all manner of customization, especially if you don't mind designing your own bits and pieces. Here it is in the garage, set up for the laser, hopefully inspiring a few modding ideas of your own. The gantry is held in place and elevated, allowing for oversized sheets to pass under the frame. Here's the birch ply from earlier, and here's a repeat of that last test cut, except now without the air assist. Needless to say, while I didn't encounter any flare-ups, the smoke released during the first couple of passes left a heavy coat of residue along the cut line. What's more, even after six passes nothing seemed ready to budge, already positioned the air assist method as the obvious winner. So with that established, it's on to the feature build. And it's probably worth noting that 100 millimeters per minute isn't very fast when the laser has to cover a distance of more than 6,000 millimeters per pass, six passes per layer, and all the travel in between the features. At this rate, each layer took about seven hours to complete, and if I may point out the obvious, yeah, this is hilariously impractical, especially as I've only been able to supervise one cut per day. But it's also the mother of all sh tests for a diode laser engraver claiming to cut wood, and this one does relentlessly. Even weeks into the project with a cooling fan matted full of grime and resin, this thing just keeps on ripping through the ply, though as you can see the elastic whip meant to hold the cables upright has eventually buckled under its own weight, relying on some overhead assistance. Nevertheless, if you're here for the review, consider this the money shot. Nearly two 
100 hours had passed with the laser operating at full power, a true testament to the machine's longevity and, to a lesser extent, my patience. What's more, there is still the small matter of putting the entire thing together, which in this case meant a lot of gluing and screwing. Insert pun, nobody's amused, let's talk about this thing. With the screws pulling double duty as alignment dowels and as clamps, everything relied on the consistency of the pilot hole pattern from one layer to the next. So I decided to drive the screws in through an alignment jig, further ensuring that the pattern doesn't stray as we advance upward. This appears to have worked well enough, in fact, the very next layer seals the whole thing shut. Taking advantage of this last chance to access the internals, armed with some wood filler and a power tube, Sophie inspected the walls for any pinhole gaps formed by the occasional imperfection along the surface of the wood. Afterwards, a bit of sanding on the outside, a bit more on the inside just to scrape away some of that loose residue, a quick wipe down with a rag, and it's onto the driver mounting plate. It's a double stack, after a fashion with a couple of M4 bolts serving as binding posts. An ample bit of glue around the landing, wires first, and the whole thing just settles into place. Afterwards, some JB weld is prepared, and the cable is ran along the waveguide to the terminal plate in the back. Then, just as a proactive measure, another batch of JB weld is spread around the bottom of the driver mounting plate. The difference in pressure from one side of this panel to the other is projected to reach nearly 0.05 bar at the 30 watts that the driver is rated for, which may not seem like much until you consider it happening no less than 35 times per second, and that's a lot of incentive for the air leaks to make themselves apparent. Needless to say, a gasket of blue tech around the driver is also a must, and with everything wired up, we can finally seal the waveguide. There's the inner layer, some more glue, and the outer layer, right on the mark. In fact, this entire pilot hole pattern approach has made the assembly effortless, albeit still very time-consuming even with a power tool. At any rate, once the two remaining layers have been sanded down, the enclosure is essentially ready to be tested, so here I've stuck it in the corner of my office, which is about as small a room as I have on hand for this, and after all the effort, I am relieved to see it perform as expected certainly along the base in the sub-base region, with a shallow dip between the two. Above all else, however, it's the distinct, unequivocal bass horn presence that ultimately defines the listening experience, and I'm wondering if any of it could be relayed over YouTube. So, what I've done here is set up a DSP with a high pass around 38Hz, everything below 80Hz going to the sub, and everything else being sent to an extended range speaker you may recall from an earlier video. This, along with some recording gear, is dragged into the living room, where I hope to demonstrate how the enclosure projects across a larger space. The microphones are set up about a meter away for the near-field demo, then about 8 meters away for the mid-field demo. And just to showcase a bit of the organic detail across the timbre, before my regular tracks, here's a few bars of some upright bass.
as you could hopefully tell, under the right circumstances, a lonesome 4-inch mid-bass can absolutely fill the listening space with some weighty, well-controlled bottom end. But now let's move it out to the car. And since I still have these RCAs ran from the head unit, I can just plug into the DSP, sending 38 to 80 hertz through the reference amp to the sub, with everything else coming through the car speakers. I will, however, bypass this until after the frequency response test. And things continue to line up as expected. Then again, it's a little late for surprises. Though, if there's one thing that continues to stand out, it's the forward-sounding character of the lows and how effortlessly they carry even beyond the immediate listening space. So much so, in fact, that I elected to include a mid-field vantage point for the in-car portion of the demo as well with the microphone set up on the bench. Once again, starting off with the upright bass. Right away, I like the idea that one day my wood cutting machine will be something that I can just hang on the wall for storage, and the Master 2S Max from AJ is a practical step toward that future. With a 75 watt laser, it is already fit for minor projects around the house. Things like plywood furniture, shelving, and as it turns out, a fully functioning tapped horn just to demonstrate some basic principles of acoustic impedance matching along the way. Speaking of which, I am looking forward to seeing what you've picked up on during the demo, as well as your choice of listening gear. The voiceover for this video was recorded with the AU AM200 bundle, thoughtfully provided by Maono. It includes a podcasting console and this large diaphragm side address studio condenser mic, which, interestingly enough, doesn't actually require phantom power. Anyhow, thank you for watching, and I may as well thank you for waiting, as it does take some time for me to put these projects together in my spare time. So, don't forget to rate this one as you see fit, subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!